SpaceX is planning a soft landing in the ocean for the first orbital flight of the Starship. For both the ship and the booster. Even if it is not clear whether the Starship will make it through re-entry, for the booster this would be very similar to the first attempted landings of the Falcon 9 boosters. These soft sea landings were already impressive for a 50 meter tall Falcon 9 booster. It would certainly be even more impressive for a 69 meter tall Starship booster. Spoiler alert, if the booster survives the sea landing, it will definitely fall to the side. In this video we look at whether and how a Starship booster floats after a soft landing in the open sea. To understand the problem we literally dive into a subsection of physics, more specifically mechanics. We deal with hydrostatics and the floating behavior of bodies. I'm Mo, I'm a naval architect from Hamburg, Germany and my channel Senkrecht Starter is the largest space channel in the German speaking world. Since many of my video topics are not available in English, I have opened an English secondary channel Senkrecht Starter Global. In case you're wondering what Senkrecht Starter means, it's the German word for vertical takeoff. Typically German, I'll start at the beginning. About 2000 years ago in ancient Greece, Archimedes is said to have found the solution to a problem by taking a bath. Legend has it that the king of Syracuse, Heron II, did not trust his goldsmith. He commissioned Archimedes to find out if his crown was made of pure gold. Archimedes solved the problem by placing the crown in a vessel and measuring the overflowing water. He compared the amount of water displaced by the crown on the one hand and by a solid gold bar on the other. He found that the crown displaced more water than a piece of pure gold of equal weight. The density of the crown was less and could not be pure gold. The goldsmith was exposed and the king was satisfied. Archimedes wrote a thesis on floating and diving behavior of bodies. Even today we therefore speak of Archimedes' principle. This principle states that the buoyancy that causes a body to float is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body. The force that creates the buoyancy is due to the hydrostatic pressure of the fluid. A liquid consists of a large number of molecules that can slide loosely past one another. That is why a liquid does not have a solid form. It needs a vessel to keep its shape. What a liquid can do, however, is transmit pressure. You notice this directly in the swimming pool when you dive very deep. Think of it simplified as many marbles. If we fill layers of marbles into a container, then each ball must carry the weight of all the balls above it and pass on this weight together with its own weight to the next marble below it. However, water molecules do not only pass on force in the vertical direction, but in all directions. If the particles were not held laterally, they would after all be pushed away to the side. So the pressure in this liquid depends on the height of the liquid column above the point to be measured. It also depends on the acceleration. On Earth we then simplify say the weight force acting on all masses. But of course that may be a different acceleration on another planet. Or think of the propellants in a rocket. When the engines fire not only does the acceleration due to gravity act on the fluid in the fuel tanks but also the acceleration of the engine. So the hydrostatic pressure on the bottom of the tank is much greater during a rocket's acceleration than when the rocket is simply standing still on the pad. Of course the rocket designer must take this into account. The loads from the propelling during a rocket launch are also a super exciting topic but today we want to talk about flotation. To summarize, if the force from the water pressure under a ship and the weight force of the ship and the cargo are equal, then the ship will float. If the ship is heavier than the displaced water causing the water pressure under the ship, the ship sinks. A special case applies to submarines, which can even float submerged in a fluid. Here the pressure forces on the top of the body together with the weight force of the submarine is exactly as great as the pressure under the submarine. Consequently, the submarine floats. By the way, according to the legend, Archimedes is said to have run naked through the city shouting Eureka! Eureka! I found it! That's by the way the motto of the state of California. California, that's where SpaceX headquarters is located. And that brings us to the Starship booster's flotation characteristics. Even if the booster is about to land in the Gulf of Mexico. Anyhow. <laughs> As we just discussed, the floating body displaces exactly the mass of a fluid equal to its own weight. Elon Musk in an interview with Tim Dodd said the booster probably weighs 160 tons plus 20 tons of residual fuel. 
We assume these numbers so we arrive at a total of about 180 tons. Since we know the booster's weight, we also know how much water the booster must displace if it is to float, namely the amount of water that corresponds to the booster's weight, 180 tons. This corresponds to a cylinder 9 meter in diameter and about 3 meters high. So a 69 meters high and 9 meters wide booster definitely has enough volume so that it could in principle float after a landing. But much more interesting is the question of how the booster would float, how stable it is after landing. Most people intuitively have a good feeling for the stability of swimming bodies. You've probably had this experience yourself. When you sit down in a small boat, the boat becomes more tippy as soon as you stand up. We then also say, oh, the boat feels unstable, or just, ooh, that tilts violently. And here your intuition is absolutely right, the boat is more stable when your weight is far down in the boat. The most common explanation is like this. The center of buoyancy must be above the center of gravity. Sort of like a stand-up man that keeps riding itself even after deflection. But very few ships are actually built with such a low center of gravity. Submarines and sailing boats, for example, where the weight has to be very low for functional reasons. For the majority of ships that sail around the world, however, the center of gravity is actually above the center of buoyancy. How is that supposed to work? Are the ships then dynamically balanced like an upright pencil on your finger? Now here's the correct explanation. As we have just noted, the buoyancy forces is a result of the water pressure on the wetted surface of a floating body. If I immerse the floating body further, the pressure under the body increases. When I then release the ship, the water pushes the ship upward like a cork to its initial position. And it does so until there is an equilibrium between buoyancy and weight again. And why can't ships sink? Well, if I push the body so far that the water can run into my ship from above, the ship's weight increases so much that the buoyancy is no longer sufficient to keep the ship afloat. Okay, that describes the vertical entry and emergence of a ship. What happens on the other hand when I twist the body? Yeah, something similar happens here. The pressure on the side towards which I turn increases. And so the center of buoyancy moves out to this side. If I then release the body again, the buoyancy forces and weight forces are not in a line of action, but generate a moment that wants to turn the ship back to its initial position. The force pair, consisting of the weight force and the buoyancy force, which wants to ride the float again, is also referred as the riding moment of a ship. However, this pair of forces is only riding up to the point where the line of action of the center of gravity is closer to the center line than the buoyancy force. If we exceed this point, we have no writing moment from this pair of forces. The situation is even reversed. The center of gravity is farther out than the center of buoyancy. Now the pair of forces even intensifies the torsion and our float tilts until the moment when it reaches a new stable floating position or simply sinks. And here we can see why the height of the center of gravity plays a role in stability. Because when the ship is leaning to one side, a high center of gravity will migrate sideways much faster than a low center of gravity. The height of the center of gravity is not the real problem, but the resulting much longer lever. In the worst case, this lever is so large that the ship simply tips over under its own weight. We say capsizes. And here too, we can fall back on your intuition. You have certainly made this experience that white ships or white rafts are more stale than narrow kayaks, for example. And we can also explain this geometrically. In a wide vessel, the center of buoyancy moves out to the side much faster than in a narrow vessel. The animations I'm including here are from the freely accessible blog of Bartosz Sianowski. His site is really, really great. Here you can play with different ship shapes and center of gravity via a slider and see how that affects the stability. A link is in the video description. But even once a ship is stable on the water, there are a variety of influences that can twist the ship. Examples would be the wind, waves or a rope pulling on the ship. What also has a negative effect on stability are partially filled tanks. This may sound paradoxically, but there are types of loading where it is better to load a ship with heavy tanks that are completely full than to load the same tanks only half full. Even if the center of gravity is higher with the full loaded tanks, this has to do with the fact that liquids want to maintain their free surfaces. Same effect when you tilt the filled glass of water. The surface remains horizontal and does not follow the tilt of the glass. If you now imagine this in a ship or a rocket, it means that when the tank tilts, the liquid 
in the partially filled tank flows in the direction of the rotation. The sinking of the Estonia, one of the worst shipping disasters, had to do with exactly that. This can be countered constructively by dividing the ships or the tanks. This then prevents large amounts of liquid from flowing over completely to one side. And we actually have the problem with partially filled tanks in the Starship booster as well. When landing, there is still residual fuel in the tanks, which wants to flow from one side to the other, if it's possible. This finally brings us to the key question of the buoyancy and stability of the Starship Booster. We can now apply what we have learned so far to the Starship Booster. In the German version of this video, I derived the height for the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy. I don't want to bore you with that here, but all my German videos have English subtitles, so you can look there. The center of buoyancy is about 4.5 meters above the base of the booster, because the engine section does not really contribute to the buoyancy. The center of gravity of the booster with residual propellants is easily 25 meters above the base. Let's assume the booster enters the water completely straight and begins to float upright. However, even the slightest tilt due to waves, wind or other forces will cause the center of gravity to not be above the center of buoyancy and consequently the booster will tip. Since we have only a very small, narrow underwater hull, the center of buoyancy does not move out to the same extent as the center of weight. The restoring forces, the uplifting forces from the buoyancy are much smaller than the overturning moment from the weight. And the further the booster tilts, the stronger this moment becomes. This upright floating position is unstable. Therefore, the booster definitely folds over like a fell tree at the latest after touchdown. And what about the free surfaces of the propellants? Yeah, these free surfaces, which flow through the side with the tilt, only aggravate the problem. We can summarize, the booster will definitely not float in an upright position under any circumstances. This brings us to another interesting question. How will it float? If the booster survives falling over, it should be possible to find a condition where the booster will remain reasonably stable. On this hydrostatic visualization, which calculates the floating position and center of buoyancy for each angle of heel, you can see quite well what happens to the center of gravity during the overturning. We can see how the booster dips more and more volume into the water on the side it's leaning towards too. At the same time, on the other side, more and more volume dives out the water. The total submerged volume must correspond to the 180 tons of the booster's weight. This means that if displacement is added on one side, displacement must be removed on the other side. You can also see pretty well in this animation the behavior of the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy. While the center of gravity holds its position in the booster, you can see how the center of buoyancy moves sideways with the immersing volume. Only when the center of buoyancy is below the center of weight, it is a stable floating position. For such a large barrel as the booster is, 180 tons is quite a little weight. Therefore, it would also rise very far out of the water. At least, if it actually survives the landing and the falling. A barrel is the right keyword. Maybe you know those scenes in cartoons when characters walk on a barrel or a log and then those cylinders spin under their feet. That's not so far-fetched because cylinders are really loosey floats when it comes to stability. Can you imagine why? The fact that the cylinder is round in cross-section means that no additional volume dips in at the sides when the cylinder is twisted. If, for example, a ship has a rather box-shaped hull cross-section, displacement will occur at the outer corner when the ship is twisted. The same applies if you have a ship shape where the ship's side is even wider at the top. Because this geometry provides additional stability, it makes sense to speak of additional form stability. On the other hand, ships where the ship's side slopes inward or the deck takes on water lose stability very, very quickly. Thus, even a wide ponton or a raft that appears stable at first glance can capsize very quickly if the deck takes on water. In a video dealing with hydrostatics, the word meter center must appear at least once. The concept of meter center makes it relatively easy to determine the initial stability of floating bodies. How this works exactly, I will explain soon. In a video about the former SpaceX oil drilling platforms Dimos and Phobos and why they would not have been well suited to launch the Starship. 
Until then, if you want to improve your intuition about hydrostatics and stable swimming positions, I highly recommend Bartosz Czernowski's really accessible site, where you can play with controllers with different ship shapes and weights and the center of buoyancy. This way you can see live how these changes affect the floating behavior of these bodies. Thanks Bartosz for letting me use your animations here. I can't wait for the Starship to finally fly. Even though the first Starship orbital flight probably won't successfully complete all of its objectives right away, SpaceX will be able to learn a lot from it. I'm sure humanity is about to take the next big leaps out there. Our personal Apollo moment. I can't wait to see it. If you feel the same way, don't forget to like. See you next time. Always stay vertical, Yomo.